What makes a man? Men lead, women follow, bro. Damn, Damn son. Man. I think a man should have absolutely no interest in whether he's actually happy. You were happy your entire childhood. That's your happy days. You're a man. Your responsibility. Work. 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 When you're trying to be nice as a man, it basically means be more like a girl. Men that cry and are soft are not attractive. You're in the position of power. You lead the relationship. Oh, you're supposed to feed the baby. Oh, you're supposed to get up with the baby as a, as a real daddy. Here's what change diapers. No, that's a lie. Uh, that's your wife's job. How bad you value man is a man with a lot of women? Yeah, apparently, yeah. Never say go to bed. Going to bed is emasculate. Cowards. Being nicer for a man in a world that you assert basically gives you a vagina. Well, if you ask these guys, it seems like they've got an entire manual ready to go. In the past few years, we've seen the stark rise of a certain niche of content dedicated to helping men reach their ultimate potential, to unlock what it means to be a real man. And from their perspective, being real men involves traits vaguely in line with dominance, strength, and status. Achieve these as they see fit, and you may just be an alpha male. The zenith of manhood, the top of the food chain, Mr. Steal Your Girl, he's got what every woman wants and what every man wants wants to be, but fail to live up to this and you're flung to the lower rungs of masculinity, cast or shall I say cursed with the role of a beta male, a label that ties the so-called simps and soy boys and vegans together. It's a term that implies your failure to succeed, seduce, and dunk yourself in Ben Franklin's, a guy they believe brings the modern man to shame. These stereotypes have long been a staple of popular entertainment and now social media. But could they still hold weight today? Are men just destined to live life like some 2000s teen movie, forever tied to rigid tropes and cliches around manhood? Also, what is it about this hierarchy that draws in so much appeal in the first place? And are the current icons of the concept truly the post poster boys of alpha men, or could it be possible this content is just oblivious at best and grifting at worst? Let's find out together. All the sexual synergy and hunger and anger and frustration and yelling and eating and breathing. Before we get into the rise of the alpha male, I think it's worth briefly covering the larger social community this ideology is a part of. And for those who don't know, I'm about to, for better or for worse, force feed y'all some forbidden fruit because we're about to dive into the manosphere. So as some of you may have guessed, the Manosphere is a testosterone-fueled whirlwind of online forums, websites, blogs, and social media groups dedicated to providing men's dating advice, self-improvement tips, and above all else, a guide on what it means to be a real man. Although most of the time, this idea of real men is specifically catered to what straight guys want and what's termed as hegemonic masculinity, the stereotypical male traits we've upheld as the masculine ideal. In Western or Westernized societies, this is often synonymous to being macho or exhibiting traits such as dominance, aggressiveness, strength, courage, competitiveness, and confidence to some extent. And let's not forget the ability to pull in the babes. It's like if a Michael Bay movie were a man. Of course, none of these traits or behaviors are inherently bad on their own, just want to clarify. But when a lot of these groups and their leading figures, I'll get to them in a minute, are constantly pushing these traits as the be all end all of one's manhood, that's when things strike a nerve. It's as if they're saying, well, if you're not the stereotypical macho man, then are you even a man? Usually anything remotely feminine to these guys is considered weak or undesirable for men. And you go watch the movie Barbie, you're 100% a beta. There's no way around it. I don't care if your girlfriend forces you. How about you force her to watch Oppenheimer? Because that's what real alphas will do. And when these beliefs are drilled into one hard enough through empowering quotes or TikTok rants, it can lead them down a slippery slope of well, misogyny, and a disdain for the guys who don't exactly fit their narrow view of masculinity. It's no surprise then that a lot of these communities are passionately anti-feminist, believing that feminism is a zero-sum game that has corrupted society, overpowering women at the expense of men, and in the process, turning the latter into a mass of weak, lost, and powerless souls. But hey, 
Don't let me tell you. We cannot deny that feminism is a man-hating ideology. Feminism was forced on women because they knew the Marxists understood that it was a means by which they would subvert the power of the men in a society. And through feminism, men grow weak. Feminism isn't just about elevating women, it's about degrading men. There's no longer this constraint, this restriction on women's sexuality that came from our faith in God. Then with the sex revolution that started, I think in the 60s, 1960s, there was the birth of the contraceptive pill. And suddenly women now had the possibility of having casual sex without the risk of pregnancy. The issue is that women are allowed to sleep around with no problems whatsoever attached to that. Feminism is great. It's helped men out completely. We're doing so well. So well that now 60% of the college uh, entrants are women and men have fallen down to 40%. Men are now earning less money on average. Women are starting to out-earn men and are still dying on the job more. Actually, like 99% of job deaths are men. Men occupy prisons. Most people that are homeless are men. Feminism, so good for men. It is a supremacism movement. It is a gender sex supremacism movement. If she's allowed to have sex, she may as well pick the best guy for that. Now the dating market has been totally open and even in encouraged for women to, you know, like indulge and to sleep around. This means that the majority of guys are not getting any attraction from women. That's going to drastically increase how lonely a lot of guys are. The cancer on culture that is feminism is to trick women into thinking that they will get their moment in the sun, that they will be in charge. Women will not be in charge. Men will not be in charge. We will all be enslaved and subjugated. They'll go back and say, well, wasn't first wave feminism a good thing, Roland? No, no, it wasn't. It essentially created the largest voting block in the United States. You know, you've got the, the beta male guys who are essentially the sneaky fuckers, right? The cuttlefish who will be happy to sort of align themselves with the feminine imperative as long as they possibly can. It kind of like pulls the teeth out of men having any kind of like organized solidarity. It's never about social justice. It's only about subjugation, enslavement, and entrainment. This that we face is not feminism. Feminism is, is a mask. What this is, this is a death cult. This is a death cult. Unsurprisingly, the manosphere is made up of a number of, say, infamous online subcultures. These including the MGTOWs, or men going their own way, who have sworn off women altogether. The Red Pilled, who believe in a gynocentric conspiracy that the world is actually dominated and focused on women. The in shells, the pickup artists, they're very cool. And of course, the alpha male content creators. While they do have a category of their own, they definitely have a lot of overlap in beliefs with the other subgroups, usually in their shared disdain for well, women. Most women, quite frankly, are useless. The alpha male sphere is most commonly found on popular video sharing spaces like YouTube and TikTok, and boy, are they thriving. Whether it's snappy advice in the form of shorts, hours long podcasts, debates, or motivational videos, these guys make up a wildly successful and accessible part of the online manosphere, dressing up their not so subtle sexism and narrow views under the guise of self improvement and modern dating advice. Although some drop the act and are just upfront about that. You can't slander me because I will state right now that I am absolutely sexist and I'm absolutely a misogynist and I have f you money and you can't take it away because I'm a realist and when you're a realist, you're sexist. So what does it mean to be an alpha male? Well, despite this buzzword making its rounds in the social media space now more than ever, it's a concept that stuck around for decades before the dawn of TikTok or YouTube or the podcast hellscape. Rooted in the pseudoscience of us human beings having the supposedly same social hierarchy as that of animals in the wild, which I will get into, the alpha male is essentially the ultimate model of man. He's well-respected, he's accomplished, women love him, and he's confident in the body he's given. And that's a pretty harmless, perfectly fine thing to aspire to. Their successes in areas of life a lot of us value. The problem, however, lies in the same way a lot of these manosphere groups tend to lose the plot. Their message can quickly devolve from be the best version of yourself to be our version of a man or you're a failure. Being respected somehow shrinks into being dominant. Being accomplished gets morphed into private jets and Bugattis, and success with women boils down to keeping them in submission. Take, for instance, one of the most beloved figures of the internet today, Andrew Tate. Having made his name online as the social media king of both an ultra-masculine and ultra-luxurious lifestyle, Tate has made the rounds for his rather provocative brand of male-targeted self-help advice. Now, to be perfectly fair, the man has shared beliefs and advice that are actually quite valid. And I'm sure a lot of passionate Tate stands, if they're even watching, are about to defend him in the comments to say this, but I will clarify. He said things that are, on their own, some pretty productive tenets to live by. Things like, do good by others, violence is bad, in a romantic or family relationship. Be honest, and others have the right to believe and act as they wish. All good things, applicable to anyone really, man or woman, I can totally respect this. What I can't respect, though, is hypocrisy. Because as much as Tate would tout these virtuous ideals, 
he contradicts himself a lot. For example, he's gone on to repeatedly teach young men how their value and purpose are tied to their work. He's all for overworking yourself as a man, bragging about how he literally doesn't sleep. The fact that I can't sleep, I've had girls say to me, you can't sleep, you need to see a psychiatrist. And I said, absolutely not. I'm glad I can't sleep. Good, I can train endlessly. That's why I'm bigger than I've ever been. I'll train every, I'm not gonna waste a minute. It's fantastic that I can't sleep. It's all the time I need. So yeah. I can train endlessly. So my point is the answer is always hard work. Saying that he doesn't believe in a work-life balance and full-on glorifying suffering and trauma that they are crucial for your self-worth and success as a man. The answer to everything is always the same. Hard work. Work harder. The worse things are, the harder I will work. My entire life is work. It's all work. Life is work. Existence is work. If I'm awake, I'm working. Every single thing I do is conscious. I work smart, I don't work hard, so I only have to work an hour a day. If working smart gets you a lot done in an hour a day, then you should work smart for 12 hours a day and get 12 times the work done. And people don't want to look at life that way. They want to talk about work-life balance and being lazy and all this crap. I don't believe in any of that. I believe in if you want to win, you have to outcompete the man who's prepared to do nothing but work. I haven't I'm missed a, a day of work in 10 years. Maybe I've had days where I've gone driving in the supercars and I've only done two hours work instead of eight hours. I've never had a day where I thought, Fuck it, I'm not my screen time on my phone is nine hours a day, every fucking day. <laughs> I am working. Earth must be conquered. Even the idea of resting aggravates my mind. Look, at, I could sit around and complain about being tired. I could sit around and be a bitch. I could sit around and cry. Or I could just work harder than I've ever worked. You have Twitch streamers who are 19 years old, fat, drinking f***ing soya milk, who have millions and millions of people paying attention to them, and they're rich now. So they're statistically successful, but they are not men, and they will never become men. Because to be a man, you must suffer. You must suffer and you must survive. But you're a man, right? And if you're a man, then it's absolutely not a really different experience of life. I think we're here to struggle. I think we're here to endure pain. The answer is always hard work. Anyone who's watching this, no matter what problem you're facing in your life, there's only one answer, work. Work harder. Think you work hard. You could work a lot harder. But then he'll also go on a supposedly motivational speech about how you're not a successful man if you're working your ass off. If you're working your ass off, you're a slave. You need freedom. Because you ain't a man if you're not free. My entire life is work. You're a worker droid. A slave. Real successful men have freedom with their time. So which is it? If you're not free, you're not a man. First, we are not a successful man. Freedom with your time. Freedom with your location. There's a riot. Cool. Go in Tokyo. See you later. Go into Australia. See you later. Bye. Okay, to be fair, if he meant you shouldn't be working your ass off for another company, is he instead saying that you should be working your ass off to gain the freedom to continue working your ass off just for your own business ventures? But at that point, wouldn't you still be a slave to work? And then how exactly would you have freedom with your time, really? I don't know. And going on about how you're successful success can only be measured by how easy it is for you to travel to Japan or Australia or wherever you want on a whim, completely dismisses the men out there who can't afford to simply trade their nine to fives to become business tycoons. Some just need to hustle through the daily rat race to literally survive. And just because they don't get to a point where they're literally living like a multimillionaire doesn't make their reality any less valuable or successful in its own way. I know that sounds super cheesy, but the guy loves to hand out his success formulas like candy, forgetting that life Life isn't a one-size-fits-all kind of game. Of course, Tate unsurprisingly rejects the idea that men should get in touch with their emotions, believing that feelings are for girls. Your friends gonna go, oh, bro, you feel sad, man? Sorry to hear that, bro. It's hard to be sad, bro. You sad, bro? Oh, we're sad too, bro. I was sad last week. Uh, what the f is wrong with you? My, my boy's around me. There is no weakness in my circle. I'm tired of hearing guys message about how they feel. I don't feel motivated. I don't feel. Feel, 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 feel. Leave the feelings to the girls, right? That's what they do. Saying that, I felt like crying, so I cried. This makes me a real man. Is as stupid as me saying, well, I felt like smashing his face in, so I smashed his face in. We're all human. There's times in your life, as a man, you're going to feel like crying. It's going to happen. But what you're supposed to do is not cry because this is a test in mental fortitude. Sitting here telling men to cry more and act with their feelings and it's okay to feel this way, that way, etc. and have no self-control. That is why we have the problems we have in the world. But you cried. There were tears that ran down my face, but I did not cry. I mean, that's crying. I would disagree. Because you, you're worried about admitting that you think you're sad. Absolutely weak. not. That's a perfectly fine scenario to cry in, but I think the act of crying is an act of desperation. To sit and to cry is an act in and of itself. To do push-ups, thinking of your children with tears running down your face, but you're concerned with finishing as many push-ups as possible within that day, I do not consider that crying. I consider that tears running down. Flat out saying that he doesn't believe in happiness, but that he also doesn't believe in depression either. I think we're here to struggle and to learn. I don't think we're here to be happy. That's why when we keep going back to the happy argument, I've always found it kind of frustrating and annoying. Yeah. Oh, but I want to be happy. Why? Why? Like, I, why do you want to sit there and laugh? Like, like, you're, you were happy your entire childhood. That's your happy day. So you're a man. Your responsibilities. Anyone who's chasing happiness, I think that's a very feminine frame. When people come to me and say, I'm not happy, I say, why should you be happy? And we're all adults here. The, this infantile mindset that we're all supposed to be like we were 
when we were three years old and oh something shiny laugh all the time run around in circles we're grown-ups and we have responsibilities and we have problems and we have pressure and you don't necessarily have to be happy to perform especially if you're a man but i don't choose happy so if you were to say to me this cup of juice will make you happy i'd say i don't want it so when i feel depressed i accept that i just feel depressed i don't believe i have depression because i don't believe depression is real i feel depressed and one day i'll stop feeling depressed because i can't have depression because it's not real a ghost can't haunt you if you don't believe in ghosts. Idiot. So if you're going to sit there and go, depression is real, actually, you don't understand the problems I'm going through. You're a moron. You are a moron. Oh, damn. It ain't real. There, I've just blown out the water. It's not real. You can come at me and say whatever you want. It's not real. If you're the kind of person who feels like they need therapy, you need someone to talk to, to make me feel better, do you know what you are? You're useless. Yes. So when men say, oh, but I don't, I feel sad, who cares? The world doesn't care. All the men who are out here to destroy you and take your girl don't care. I have the same exact view on depression. It's and I've, I've said it multiple times. And I don't understand why people are so damn outraged by it because it's not that big of a fucking deal. As a man, you have to control your emotions. So I don't give a shit if you're depressed. If you don't believe in depression, you can't be depressed. It's bullshit. There, there's your hope. It's bullshit. You're being a bitch. Get up and be a man. You hear that, fellas? Just stop being sad. The world out here would be a much happier place if we just stop listening to the scientists and start listening to more alpha male podcasts. So the guy believes that depression, a clinical mental illness, is a myth. And that happiness is unproductive towards being a real alpha dude. But then he'll rant in another interview about how the Matrix, his term for current society, I guess, doesn't give a f enough about men and their feelings. I think that we've set up the world now in a way where men are seen as worker droids. They're expected to go work all day, come home, uh, clean up as well, share the cleaning with the woman. Now you're coming home to a household where everyone just thinks you're the dude who should just work. You're just a worker droid, you're the slave, you're the robot. And your feelings don't matter and your authority doesn't matter and get so when men say, oh, but I don't, I feel sad. Who cares? The world doesn't care. All the men who are out here to destroy you and take your girl don't care. And did you catch how upset he was about how men are just seen as work slaves? Sir? Isn't that what you want? And despite honesty being one of his key tenets of masculinity, he's sure getting away with allegedly swindling netizens of their money with flimsy promises of wealth and fortune. Coffeezilla has a great video breaking down his pretty misleading online course, Hustlers University, where the only person getting hustled is you, it seems. So I'll leave a link to that if you want to get more into it. I think I've spent long enough discussing how the supposed alpha of online alpha males may not actually have opinions worth listening to, but I of course can't mention Mr. Tate without bringing up a driving factor in his successful content. Misogyny. And lots of it. Andrew is misogynistic. People who are going to walk through earth and repeat that, they have no evidence. They have no proof. They can't tell you why. I will state right now that I am absolutely sexist and absolutely misogynist. And I have you money and you can't take it away. Women are women everywhere, right? The women are a pain in the ass everywhere. This idea that you're going to go to some town somewhere and it's going to be the haven of beautiful girls who know their place. I don't believe that's real. I picked this up. You ain't with me. But I'm a left hand. I'd still like jab. I could swing low. What would a woman do? I don't let women drive me in cars. I'm losing their mind when I say this. I'll drive. Never. Let's Never. Never drove your Bugatti. What the f who, who is this guy? That's Cat. No! But would you let one of the boys drive it? Yeah, boys, it's fine. I said if I were to get on a plane, and I were to, that plane was to fly into the eye of a hurricane, there was a 50% chance of it crashing. I want a male pilot, because I think that males are better under stress and under pressure. Do you think women are the property of men? No. The point I was why, making- Why have you said they are? You think that women are property. So I think my sister is my her husband's property, yes. I believe the woman is given to the man. I believe she's given away by the father. I believe she belongs to the man. So you she do, belongs to so the fundamentally, man. All right. So fundamentally, you do believe that a woman becomes a man's property. I believe she belongs to the man in marriage, correct? Oh, you see, that to me is misogyny. And you're entitled to your opinion. Like, look, without disrespect, you're a 19 year old female. What, what do you know? I don't expect you to know anything. So I don't know why you're trying to give me your opinion because I don't, I don't put any responsibility on you to perform in, in basically any way outside of the bedroom. So just shush. The reality is sexist. I guess I'm a little bit of a sexist, but that's how it goes. I perfected this in pimp school. When I got my PhD, we had to practice if a girl comes at you, ah, how you cheating? Are you cheating? It's bang out the machete, boom in her face, and then grip her up by the neck. Like, shut up, bitch. Machete's on the floor. Her panties are all wet. Slap, slap, grab, choke, shut up, bitch. sex. I am the nicest guy. Kind of strange, but not out of character to uphold values of being a good person and then also outright proudly admit to being a misogynist. Not to mention how the dude has also been charged for rape, human trafficking, and organized crime in Romania. So just green flags all around. And I'm not sure what's worse, the fact this dude's as gross and ridiculous as he is, or the fact that netizens across the globe have actually eaten this shit. 
up. And this seems to be an overarching theme among other leading alpha male commentators. Currently sitting at 1.47 million subs at the recording of this video, the now demonetized Fresh and Fit podcast hosted by two goobers named Walter Weeks and Myron Gaines have made social media waves for their dating tips and advice on how to avoid being a better male, which include not cooking because it is submissive and therefore the woman's job. Who do you cook for your girl? Guys, unless you're a chef and you're like really good and you can use it as a DHV, no, she should be cooking for you because cooking is a submissive role. The girl should be cooking for you. Having your girlfriend delete her Instagram because Instagram equals cheating in a relationship. If you got a girl and you're dating her seriously, she's your main chick and she has all an Instagram as well as maybe sexy photos of herself on the internet, that is cheating. Oh, you, you're just insecure, blah, blah, blah. No. If she wants a relationship with you, you're going to have it on your terms, which means she isn't going to do that cheating BS that Western society tells women they can do. Protect her from herself. Not caring about pleasing her. Who gives a f about a woman's orgasm? It's useless. Right. Uh -huh. What's up? And forbidding her from going out with friends. She can't go out with her girls when she's in a relationship with you? No. no what? Right. But where does she get to be herself and not have to think about my room or, 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 you know. With the children. There is at least one time or one day out of the month that I want to go out for myself. Not go to the club because I want to go to the club, but I love to dance. So um, you get me? how about this option? Hire a babysitter, <laughs> right? And then dance at home. I just want to go to the beach and sit down for, for an hour or two. Would you have a problem with that? I mean, I'm going with you. You're not going to go by yourself. You got to protect women from themselves, man. Anytime a man puts his foot down and represses female sexuality, it's considered misogynistic, toxic, or insecure, or you're controlling. No, I'm in control. That's the difference. I don't let you dictate how the this goes. How about I translate what you're implicitly saying in all of this, Myron? I'm a grown ass adult who can't cook. I'm insecure and have trust issues. I've got bad bedroom game. I'm insecure and have trust issues. Yeah, they all sound like you problems at the end of the day. It's kind of remarkable, really, how much they tell on themselves while pretending to be paragons of male confidence. It's needless for me to say at this point that they pretty much primarily view women as accessories for status and sexual pleasure. I mean, just listen to what Myron deems as the key rules for being a worthy girlfriend. Does your girl one, cook and clean unprompted. Does she shut up in front of your friends? Does she ask for your permission to do things out of respect? Does she forego hanging out with friends in public settings such as clubs, nightclubs, etc. for you? Does she give you sex regardless of how she feels? And then finally, does she give up her social media for you? If she isn't doing these basic things for you guys, you need to start really considering if this girl is the one. If a chick isn't you, she's not respecting you. She's not sucking your on command. She's not making you food. She's not serving you. She's useless. I'm going to say that again. Their dating advice doesn't come down to building healthy romantic relationships nurtured through mutual love and respect. It's about finding a woman who they can ultimately control while still getting their rocks off and who also doubles as their maid. That's very important. In fact, it's quite interesting how much they view being with women as a burden beyond these things. Having a female partner is ultimately a net loss unless they're a housekeeping service and an on-call sex machine. Unlike what I've seen with Andrew Tate, however, these guys even go as far as to give women relationship advice, usually the ones they're somehow able to pull onto their podcast. A few noteworthy gems include how fidelity is the woman's job. Sexual fidelity is a woman's role, okay? A man is capable of providing for and f***ing multiple women. If you're gonna date a man that's attractive, tall, has money, whatever, be prepared to share him. Female loyalty is sexual fidelity, but when, again, we're going back to how women think men or women are the same. They think, well, you should also exercise sexual fidelity. Uh, no, men and women are different. How women should simply be seen, not heard. Women are be, see be seen and not be heard, bro. Like, if I bring you around my friend, shut the fuck up. And how a low body count, aka the number of people you've slept with, is imperative. But of course, this doesn't apply to the guy, because that's just the way it is. The reason why it's brought up is because it matters for men. It doesn't matter for women. That's the difference. So it doesn't matter, it doesn't guys. matter for women? You don't think no, so? No, 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 no. Like, if a guy's ran through, I'm going to be like, the f there's no such thing as a guy getting ran through. Thank men ran Mar through. <laughs> men run through women. Thank you, Mar it's not the other way Thank around. You, I don't know why we live in this crazy world where women think men and women are equal. It's not a There's no such thing as male hoes. There's a reason why men that have sex with a lot of women are respected and women that have sex with a lot of men are admonished. Yes. So a man that has sex with a lot of women brings value to the world to some degree. Women that have sex with a lot of dudes lose value in the world to some degree. Having a lot of sexual partners is bad for both genders. Wrong. It's actually bad for women, not for men. Sex does not affect men the same way it does women. I wish we can go back to a time where you're getting married at virgins, the families know each other, she comes from a good household. 
old, her dad was in her life, blah, blah. But those days are fucking done. I will say it does make sense how much this guy wants a submissive yes girl for a wife, a dog, essentially. As it seems like the tiniest bit of aggressive pushback from a woman sends him into a borderline tantrum. Keep reminding me, 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 reminding me that, I'm young, that I'm your age. No, no, you're, it, it's, uh, it's okay. I'm it's not, okay. You're you older. said you're 42, right? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not your age. It's okay. That's, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> they do have just for men. So your, your grades is conflicting with me. This, this exemplifies perfectly what I mean when I say modern day women don't respect men. She's on my fucking podcast. I get crazy talking like this. And the reason why is because most guys don't give women consequences for their poor decisions. So I'll be the first one to do it. You can get the fuck off the show too. Oh, oh, nice. Nice. Bad leadership. Ridiculous. If you're going to state an opinion, that's one thing. But if you're going to state a fact and you have multiple females on here telling you that's not true. What are you talking, bro? What are you talking about? Bro, you're literally saying that all females want is one thing. What did you just say? All females want what? Repeat what you just said if you remember what you just said. You can't, right? All right, next topic. Yo, who anyway. the f do you think you are, bro? I'm like, Lex. seriously. That's who I think I am. We're all here for a show. Oh, like, and, we're all and you're our also opinions. off the podcast. Wait, get the out of here, man. Get the f out of here. Get the cop out of here. No, what I said was. What I Yo, who the f are you yelling at? What I said, what because at? I don't like what you're doing here, because I literally now for the third time it's me that Number I said. One. Hold on, hold on. Let's set some ground rules. Let's set some ground rules. Do not ever yell at me again. Don't do that. Do not f***ing yell at me. I don't know who okay, the hell you think you are. Don't, don't cuss at me. Yo, get the f*** off the show. Why would anyone change? Yo, Sorry. yo, when I'm talking, shut the f*** up. I'm not one of these f***ing simps on your sh that's going to sit here and let you talk crazy. Hey, guys, we appreciate you letting us be here. Be like, quiet, we you're still here. talking, I'm man. Just, I was just God saying damn. we appreciate it. I'm talking right okay. now. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, shut up. Got to get these old chicks in check. It's wild out here. I'm talking. <laughs> now I'm shut old, the up. Chivalry is dead because women have more options than they ever had before thanks to the internet, dating apps, etc. So therefore, why is a girl going to sit there and take roses from the nice guy when she has a bad boy NBA player sliding in her DMs if she's attractive enough? Depends on women the girl. Yo, shut the up. Shut you should focus on controlling your emotions. The more emotionally volatile the girl is, the more stable and stoic you need to be. Hey guys, we appreciate you letting us be here. Be like, quiet, we still here. talking, I'm man. Just, I was just Goddamn. Probably why they try to only ever get women on who they know can challenge them on their beliefs. So they can happily spout their garbage while clowning on them for three hours. Editing Anna here. So I think it's also hilarious to note that they were once exposed for allegedly using a sugar baby service app to essentially pay some girls to be on their show. You approached me on a sugar daddy <laughs> website and asked me to be your sugar baby and then Never couldn't did. afford my allowance. Never did. He couldn't afford my $10,000 allowance a month and said, huh? Uh, that's funny. Why don't you just come on my podcast instead? So he pays forty dollars a month to be on a pod or to be on a fucking app. It's called Seeking Arrangements yes. to troll women. Yes. <laughs> and I know yes. a bunch of girls have talked about it because that's his thing. That's how he gets women so to come I just want to be. So thank you for cementing the fact that I don't pay girls off sugar sites. Facts. Thank you. Then why are you and on then that? Also, why are you on that? Because I use it as a dating site. I've said it many times. <laughs> That is gold. But it's not just the men leading this crusade against the modern ladies everywhere. In just the past year, a new fighter has entered the ring, this time in the shape of a 26-year-old woman named Pearl Davis. In general, men are better than women. No, that is not to be funny. Yes, I 100% believe that. Now, Pearl is interesting because she blatantly advocates for policies and societal values that would degrade and critically disadvantage her as a woman, all the while propping men up to be the superior gender and championing what she believes to be the playbook of ideal masculinity. And with this, she'll also often excuse the bad behaviors of certain men for no other reason than that's just the way it goes. And I honestly am just really tired of people exposing these cheating men. Well, we know rich men cheat. They've always cheated. The top 15% of men have always had harems of women. This is me saying, all right, if you go for this type of guy, this is probably what you can expect. And I think as women, it's better to just accept that may happen and that you should stick it out. Uh, men, I just think, are biologically predispositioned to sleep with a lot of women. Of course, this same charity is never extended to women who are often her favorite subject of criticism. A man cheated? Well, the woman shouldn't have picked the wrong guy. Uh, again, like they could say, oh, I hate cheaters, but we pick them. We all know that the majority of men can't cheat. So if we're picking a guy that cheats, is there a part of us that likes the drama? A man was handed divorce papers? Well, that's because his wife's just being selfish. You've got to ask yourself these questions. Why are the women turning back on their men? 
Because why? they're selfish. Because about, they're selfish. Why, no, why, apart unexisting. from being selfish, yeah. you need more than selfishness. It because, can't be that. because I mean, some of the number, like some of the top indicators of divorce are uh, fin financial cheating and irreconcilable differences. differences. Yeah, that's like the top three. It's funny how she's subtly implying how all these factors must be the woman's fault. And if she isn't, then she pretty much just contradicted her own argument. She's also lamented how dudes are struggling in the dating market because not enough women are choosing to stay virgins for them, which she states is a prerequisite for most men. They don't really they don't have a choice. Like no guy expects a virgin. Guys adapt to the market. I mean, because there's studies that indicate that it's a need for men. So if it's a need and the whole market is non-virgin yeah. women, like what are they what supposed to do? Forget how it's these specific guys having an outdated view of relationships and women in general, it's the femoids choosing to abandon such virtuous purity. To Pearl, it's as if nearly every issue men face today and what she sees are our current societal problems squarely lands on the shoulders of modern women. She's repeatedly generalized today's women as narcissistic, hypergamous, ungrateful, conniving, self-centered, and most of all, stupid. And was I, I literally couldn't think of one thing that women are better at. Giving birth. <laughs> if men could figure out a way to do it, I would argue they'd figure out a way to do well, it. Well, let's hope they don't. Which have led to policy changes and cultural shifts that have only kept men from fulfilling their birthright as the dominant place in society. Honestly, guys, I think it's quite weird when you see female bosses like yelling at young men. It's like such a weird dynamic to me. It's a weird dynamic to see like women having power over men. It should come as no surprise then that this woman absolutely loathes women's progress in all forms, all the way down to the suffrage movement. So what is, you say your anti-feminism, feminism was basically a mistake. And that's, are you going back to the beginning of feminism? Like the whole history of feminism, like women's suffrage and everything? Yeah, no, I don't. You don't f with women's suffrage? No. You don't think women should get the right to vote? No, no, I don't. Okay, so are you serious or are you kidding? No, I'm serious. Okay, so women shouldn't get, they shouldn't have the right to vote. Yeah. Why? No. Um, because men are signed up for selective service, so they're fined $300,000 if they don't sign up for selective service when they're 18. I think if we want the same rights, it comes with the same responsibilities. Do you think women should be drafted into the army? <laughs> no. Okay, so no, then there's a point. paradox. No, but that's my she believes our purpose in life is to marry and procreate as early as the law permits it if possible. You're speaking to women. You're saying, mm -hmm. Past 22, your value is mean, going down. And, yes, and your message, to, to men, your, men, to, and your, your value on the sexual marketplace. I mean, don't, don't wait till, you know, 35 to get married. Get married as young as you can. The elites, the feminists want you to spend your reproductive years working instead of raising a family. Completely neglecting how she should probably get off the internet and abandon her widely successful and profitable career if she truly believed and lived by her principles. So why should I engage with in a, in a conversation with you at all if you're, if women are just emotional? Should I be talking to a man about this probably why do you bother to even have a platform shouldn't you just concede <laughs> to a man yeah probably you right. know so we got to look for a man to replace you in fact, she's even referred to equal rights as a somehow evil concept, a mere product of the modern woman's delusion. They've even brainwashed us in the church telling us, oh, we need to equally submit to our husband. Guys, we have to start calling this shit out. Anything that implies we're equal is evil. And it is brainwashing and it is meant to break down the family and break down society. Which brings me to one of the major reasons I think these creators and their followers express such searing devotion towards these old school ideals of masculinity and gender roles. A lot of it is rooted in this pushback against changing ideas of what it means to be a man or woman in today's current and continuously evolving society. We're now constantly challenging whether the damaging stereotypes of masculinity are the only way a man can be. The very ideas that taught us boys don't cry or the number of women you bed is somehow tied to your self-worth. Down to the more arbitrary lines drawn between what are girl things and what are boy things and god forbid you like any of the girl things. Likewise, we're now increasingly critical of the double standards placed on women and continuously empower them to reach for the same independence and success as men back in the day. And a lot of us embrace these changes. It's good. It's progress. For others, it's uncomfortable to see the structures and lifestyles you were so used to seeing fall apart at the feet of these new perspectives. And that's a completely normal thing to feel. But while many may at least choose to understand where these new views are coming from, others will simply dig their heels in and 
deem these changes as destructive to their version of society. They see it as a zero-sum objective, that the empowerment of the disadvantaged or minority must necessarily equate to the oppression of the already privileged majority. Those who support the former are simply brainwashed droids that need to be deprogrammed, a term they literally use to describe those with more progressive views on gender roles, women especially. So we live in a world now where women enter the workforce, they go to school, they're more educated. They've kind of put their career first over having feminine duties and motherly responsibilities. A lot of women stave all these things to pursue a career. If your girl grew up in the United States or came from a higher education, whatever it may be, you're going to have to deprogram certain bad habits. If I get a girl, right, that was raised in the West, no offense, I'm going to have to detrain a lot of bad habits out of her. I want to go girls nights out. No. Oh, I want to go hang out with my friends at the club. No. Nope. I want to do this. Nope. Is it hating women to let them know at 35, you're basically biologically useless to men and maybe we should try to have kids earlier rather than later? Wouldn't that be good for someone that's 18 to hear 16? I I'm not really worried about the, the older women because I mean, I, I think it's tough to deprogram most of this stuff. Females are sheep. Women are extremely simple. Women are programmable. Women are blank slates and they're either programmed by you as a man or they're programmed by society. The good wife who obeys her man and cooks for him and cleans for him has been programmed by her man. The woman who goes, I don't need no man. I'm a feminist. That has been programmed by society, by the BBC. They're all born blank, and someone inserts the programming. For people like Tate and Fresh and Fit and Pearl Davis, accepting gender equality or new forms of masculinity will mean abandoning the clear-cut, familiar guidelines set by traditionalism. And if you're an impressionable young man or woman, embracing the latter is ultimately easier than challenging these norms and adopting a more fluid perspective of the world. Which is why the dudes who fall in this camp can so easily consume alpha male ideology. It gives them a simplified, stable guideline of how to be. Simply do these things and you're fulfilling your purpose as a man. It's a black and white, but ultimately convenient way of building confidence in one's male identity, asserting this rigid binary between real successful masculinity, aka the alpha male, and weak, undesirable masculinity, aka the beta male, using the latter as a quick and simple narrative to explain their failures. The former, on the other hand, promises physical fitness sexual prowess, and wealth, their trifecta of ultimate manhood. And given how they're selling the concept like snake oil, most leading figures in the alpha male sphere will go to near absurd lengths to prove their dominance in each category. They'll speak of pulling women like they're collecting Pokemon, even if it means telling some embarrassing tall tales. But I met this guy at a pool party. He's an NBA player. So I give him my Instagram, and lo and behold, he followed me. He said, wait, you know this chick? So he pulls up this, this girl's profile. I was like, yeah, I know her, bro. I used to like do her back in the day. He's like, damn, that's my shorty want to come in town. So basically, we were smashing the same chick. No, you weren't. The only thing you've been smashing is your meat into your hand, you liar. I'm at his magic party, right? There's like 40 girls and like five guys. He says to me, yo, come through, bro. So he's like, yo, pick three that you want, and I got you. I was like, three that I want? Is it like a buffet? Shoot, I'll take it. Bro, this does not sound like an NBA player. This sounds like human trafficking. The constant tough guy posturing is a staple, as is their incessant flexing of a lavish lifestyle. And boy, is the promise of wealth a real thing in this field of content. These creators also seem to double as supposed financial advisors, with Tate taking the cake on that one. So it's clear why their message sells. Spun through well-spoken words, a charismatic presence, and an exceptionally thin veil of pseudo-intellectualism, these people dangle men a promise of an instant upgrade to life. So long as you buy their courses, check out their affiliate links, and sub to their channel, of course, we'll get to all of that. And seeing how the internet has fostered this culture of packaging one's personality or identity into catchy, convenient terms, what's more empowering than the alpha male label? It's like a shortcut to validating one's masculinity, or at least helping them make sense of how to be amid societal expectations of manliness. And with such weight placed on labels, the community has gone on to spawn another form of alpha maleness, this time with a dash of mystery and uh, somehow even cringier Instagram quotes. <laughs> If you've spent enough time in the realm of TikTok, Instagram, or even YouTube shorts, then you've likely come across this brand of content at least once. This 
is the Sigma male. Characterized by Urban Dictionary as a socially disinterested loner, the Sigma male is like the Alpha's more introverted brother. Both claim to be at the top of the food chain, but whereas Alpha males seek power through dominance and bravado, Sigmas thrive on being quiet, cool, and calculating to gain the upper hand. Silence is their strategy, ensuring they stay an enigmatic or mysterious presence that no one, especially their enemies, can decipher. These guys claim to be lone wolves, defying the need for external validation and refusing to conform to social norms. Which is why if you want to be a Sigma male and gain the standard successes of wealth, status, and women, be sure to read our guidebooks, our how-tos, and watch our endless tutorials for the exact steps to playing by your own rules. As you can probably tell, consistency is optional when it comes to these manosphere archetypes, but they strike a chord with plenty of mainly young men regardless, and the Sigma male is no exception. Who cares about the irony of trying to look cool while claiming to not care what others think? It's easy to forget this paradox when you're fed with flashy content that, similarly to the alpha male's playbook, promises you the keys to self-confidence and financial success. Sigma males go a step further, however, to declare themselves apart from the existing social hierarchy. They proudly forge their own independent path, and this resonates particularly among the more reserved personality types in their audience. So far, none of the stuff I've mentioned, again, is inherently harmful. There's absolutely nothing wrong with being a more calculated or introverted person or using these traits to your advantage. And once again, to be fair, a lot of Sigma male content could also just be basic self-improvement tips, like be independent, be self-reliant, think for yourself type of mantras. But like with a lot of alpha male advice, things start to get a little sus when you begin claiming your superiority to others based on these traits. So introspection and silence may be equated to being some dark intellectual genius league smarter than everyone else. Being more cool and calculated suggests you're secretly dangerous with the hidden power to manipulate others to your bidding. An uncaring attitude just means you're above the schmucks who conform to the whims of conventional society. For the men out there who feel alone or misunderstood, it could serve as a quick yet misguided assurance that they're not lost, they're just somehow better than the rest. And needless to say, a superiority complex won't fix your insecurities. In fact, most, if not all the time, it's indicative of them. Still, the Sigma continues to be admired as the rarest male archetype that, ironically, thousands of people identify with and is even further glorified through characters in fictional media. And you definitely know the type, brooding, troubled, yet effortlessly cool. The anti-heroes of Little Words often played by Keanu Reeves, Ryan Gosling, or Killian Murphy. These guys are typically written as the loners or eccentric outsiders of their society, though exude magnetic charisma and boast triumphant storylines against their oppressors. They've got the physical strength, intellectual brilliance, and most importantly, unshakable self-confidence to get their way in most situations, despite their enigmatic facade. The admiration for these protagonists has become such a trend that it's even spawned its own meme. The literally me characters of popular media, with the name reflecting how many viewers tend to self-identify with these figures. Plenty of them, after all, represent the underdog story or depict common grievances in society. Taxi driver's Travis Bickle, a grandfather of this character trope, could be seen as an early example. A former soldier suffering existential crises, he wrestles with his crippling loneliness and a burning vigilante's desire to rid the streets of its crime and perceived depravity. In recent years, we've gotten Joaquin Phoenix's Joker, an outcast who finds power in being an anarchic symbol of of chaos and rebellion. Drive's unnamed protagonist is a stoic, lonely guy who finds purpose in protecting a woman he falls in love with. Each one your textbook social renegade, all Sigma males in their own right. It makes sense how many experiencing similar discontent will find catharsis in not only watching these relatable struggles play out on screen, but also seeing them conquered by gripping, charismatic leads. As written by Logan Bry of Michigan State University's The Current, these characters don't idly decay in a state of misery, but rather Rather, they take matters into their own hands and see satisfaction for themselves, which is inspiring. But I probably don't have to tell you how all this charm usually harbors a dark side. Machiavellianism and skewed philosophies are also common traits written into these characters, helping them justify their often morally dubious means of taking action or enacting change, which could involve being an asshole at best and, uh, 
the odd murder at worst. And don't get me wrong, these things are what make them compelling. The fact that they're not your squeaky clean saviors adds layers of complexity to the stories they tell. Sometimes they're even just a straight up villain in the grand scheme of things, but it's fascinating to watch how they grapple with their morality or lack of one. Unfortunately, and this isn't necessarily the fault of the writers, their captivating allure can often blind certain audiences to their flaws. And a lot of them are also brought to life by excellent and or conventionally attractive actors, which adds to their magnetism. If you're viewing things selectively or at surface level, it can be easy to overlook their twisted ethics or the cautionary tales they actually represent. Instead, they become icons for their superficial charms and supposed victories, characters to resonate with and admire. Which brings me to a leading example of this. Christian Bale's Patrick Bateman. Do you know what Ed Gein said about women? Ed Gein, maitre d'a canal bar? No, serial killer, Wisconsin in the 50s. And what did Ed say? He said, when I see a pretty girl walking down the street, I think two things. One part of me wants to take her out and talk to her, be real nice and sweet and treat her right. And what the other part of him think? <laughs> what her head would look like on a stick. Considering this dude comes straight out of a flick called American Psycho, it's kind of hilarious how he's become the poster boy for the literally me crowd. Anyway, released in 2001 to an initially divisive response from both audiences and critics, American Psycho follows the disturbing double life of an investment banker named Patrick Bateman. The man revels in the wealthy excesses of his superficial yuppie lifestyle, basking in designer suits, exclusive restaurants, and well, homicidal tendencies. On the surface, the film offers up an incredibly lavish image of American consumerism and Wall Street culture, displaying its characters in various settings of status and luxury. Bateman is rarely seen without a perfectly pressed suit and tie and a meticulously groomed appearance. His scenes are constantly punctuated with visual details of opulence and material wealth. The same extends to the rest of his peers, who showcase just as much prestige. This impression alone could explain why Bateman's become a popular icon con for the literally me sigma community. He symbolizes success while exuding supposedly stoic confidence. And it helps that he's of course played by Christian Bale who looks like a Greek statue come to life. Numerous YouTube shorts and TikToks embrace Bateman as the face for motivational sigma content. And yes, while a lot of this stuff is also just ironic and for a fun meme, there are those and many that unironically glamorize his phrases, his routine, and his supposedly confident demeanor. It's ironic how the characters enjoy a renewed popularity in recent times due to his seemingly cool disposition and stature. Since back in the mid-2000s, his cult following was born when audiences began embracing these elements as intended. Satire. Patrick Bateman, for all his wealth and superficial bravado, lives an ultimately hollow existence. His obsession with upkeeping a perfect image, particularly among those he considers upper class or elite, is a glaring spotlight on his deep-seated insecurities and desperate need for validation. He's caught in a world where appearances are everything, and yet there's nothing beneath the surface. None of his fancy suits or designer accessories can fill his lingering emptiness. He attempts to sound enlightened or intellectual with his opinions, but merely parrots the popular sentiments of the current era. Come on, Bryce. There are a lot more important problems than Sri Lanka. We have to end apartheid for one, and slow down the nuclear arms race, stop terrorism, and world hunger. We have to provide food and shelter for the homeless, and oppose racial discrimination, and promote civil rights. We have to encourage a return to traditional moral values. We have to promote general social concern, unless materialism can help people. <laughs> Even the way he lists off these political issues sounds inauthentic, as if he's reading off a script. So you can see the irony in genuinely using this guy as your Sigma grind set king. For a concept that supposedly hails the ethos of not giving a fuck, the man sure does crumble at the slightest threats to his social standing. I can't believe that Bryce prefers Van Patten's card to mine. The tasteful thickness of it. Oh my god. It even has a watermark. Something wrong? Patrick? You're sweating. As Connor Mannion puts it in his piece on this film, there's this burning desire to be an ubermensch above the normies, and yet he remains another cog in the machine. I hate that job anyway. I see why you just don't quit. Because I want to fit in. Even his values are a facade. He'll tell his friends to cool it with the anti-Semitism while wielding his own brand of racism. No, just uh, cool it with the anti-Semitic remarks. Not a big music fan, huh? No, I like music. 
just there. He was too black sounding for me. And later berates a homeless man for not working hard enough after championing social support with his colleagues. We have to provide food and shelter for the homeless. Most importantly, we have to promote general social concern. You know how bad you smell? You reek of shit. Get a goddamn job, Al. You got a negative attitude. Perhaps his Manosphere iconography is then poetic, given how much of Alpha and Sigma content similarly suffers from its own ideological contradictions. Oh yeah, and we haven't even gotten to the fact that this guy is a homicidal maniac. From the get-go, Bateman's feelings of inadequacy lead to pent-up rage and self-loathing. We soon learn that he channels all this in a rather unhealthy way. Murder and lots of it. Or at least we're led to think. Part of the film's brilliance is that it never really clarifies whether his crimes truly happened or they were simply delusional fantasies. Either way, it's clear the guy is brimming with repressed emotion, something he even acknowledges. I have all the characteristics of a human being. Flesh, blood, skin, hair. But not a single clear, identifiable emotion, except for greed and disgust. As the film goes on, he grows increasingly self-aware of his misery and disturbed thoughts or tendencies, but has no healthy outlet for expressing this. In a circle of equally self-absorbed, narcissistic business suits, no one bothers to listen to him. You could interpret this as a reflection on the struggles of real-world men, how many are taught from a young age to repress or internalize their vulnerable emotions. Sure, Bateman's internal struggles and coping mechanisms are far more twisted and extreme, but just as he lacks constructive ways of dealing with them, so do real guys from cultures or societies that stigmatize their emotional expression. Plenty of male viewers may also find it cathartic to watch his vain pursuits of status, women, and material possessions, echoing the rigid and sometimes unattainable standards that dictate what a successful man's lifestyle or identity looks like. Sounds pretty familiar. And while his aggression is clearly portrayed as sinister and well wrong, it could also be viewed as a consequence of these cultural attitudes that harm men in the long run. But sure enough, you'll also get the viewers who would completely reject this, claiming that the movie isn't a critique of restrictive masculine ideals, but rather a calling back to them. Like this random comment I found suggesting how the film warns against the repressive harms of shifting gender roles, intersectionality, and the medical industrial complex. Huh? Though while I may have my readings of the film as others would have theirs, for what it's worth, director Mary Harron ultimately intended for a commentary on, quote, American vulture capitalism, and not just American really. Bateman is the embodiment of everything that's wrong with the system. All the worst and craziest forces, obsession with services, obsession with status, obsession with acquisition, and then the frustration and violence, all of those things. Things that evidently aren't foreign to typical alpha male ideas. She also viewed her source material, Brett Easton Ellis' novel of the same name, as a subversive gay man's analysis of straight male behavior. Ellis himself has admitted how his own yuppie experiences inspired the book, stating that he was slipping into a consumerist kind of void that was supposed to give him confidence and make him feel good about himself, but just made him feel worse and worse and worse about himself. That is where the tension of American Psycho came from. Ellis has even gone on to praise Heron for effectively bringing out the deliberate satire in his book, an aspect sorely overlooked by most readers at the time. But while people were once outraged and even staged protests due to their superficial readings of the subject matter, today's netizens are now motivated by a superficial view of Bateman's image. What's ironic as well was how Heron actively avoided romanticizing Bateman and his lifestyle. The one thing you couldn't do was think Bateman was in any way cool, she says. And it was one of the major reasons she was so adamant in casting Christian Bale for the role. In an interview for Movie Maker magazine, she shares how he didn't see Bateman as cool. I sort of had the feeling a lot of the other actors kind of thought Bateman was cool, and he didn't. Evidently, plenty of online content thinks otherwise, and granted, maybe they haven't even seen the film and are just hopping on a trend, but the irony is amusing regardless. In fact, even Bale himself has shared his encounters with people who seem to genuinely admire Bateman. I went and visited, you know, all different levels of people at Wall Street, but the guys on the trading floor when I arrived there before making the film and a bunch of them they were going oh Patrick Bateman and patting me on the back and going oh yeah we love him and I was like yeah ironically right and they were like what do you mean so it was always worrying but you know clearly look it's a satire 
on capitalism in the 80s. And he himself has expressed how ridiculous he finds the character, how he isn't even the captivating kind of villain you'd see as badass or intimidating. He's just incredibly entertaining for how pathetic he is. Bateman is not a... I could never really view him just as a villain because he's so ridiculous, you know? He's not your ordinary kind of Hannibal Lecter scary villain because you laugh at him, you know, never with him. What do you like about Patrick Bateman? Um, I like nothing about him. I mean, he's a completely unredeeming <laughs> character. At the end of it all, all Bateman is, is a pretty face. But perhaps the same can't be said for another Sigma male icon as of late, a character who not only flaunts an irresistible self-confidence, but also wholeheartedly walks the talk. A character genuinely admired for his convictions, while once again dismissed for the underlying commentary. So, let's talk about Tyler Durden. We're not your job. You know how much money you're in the bank. Not the car you drive. Not the contents of your wallet. Not your fucking khakis. We can't forget the king of misunderstood satires, at least in recent decades. Even before the rise of the Sigmas, we already had a proto-literally-me character for the masculinity-obsessed circles of the pre-Reddit era. The phenomenon of 1999 fight clubs, Tyler Durden. Now, if you haven't seen this movie yet, then this is your excuse to take a two-hour break and do so, because it's really good, one of my all-time favorites, actually. Sadly, it's also really misread and continues to be, so spoiler alert, I will be revealing everything about this film. Fight Club, directed by David Fincher, based on the book by Chuck Palahniuk, follows the miserable life of a nameless, insomniac office worker played by Edward Norton. This guy has as soul-sucking of a routine as it gets, caught in the loop of a passionless corporate job, with nothing but empty consumerism as his only purpose. That is, until he crosses paths with a charismatic soap salesman named Tyler Durden. Played by Brad Pitt, Tyler loves to wax philosophical on breaking the shackles of modern conformity. He sees the American dream as a false promise, scoffs at those who embrace convention, and believes that the only way to truly be free is to reject societal rules altogether. This, of course, captivates our protagonist, who longs to escape his mundane world of photocopies and IKEA magazines. So together, they create an underground fight club, a cathartic place for men to release their rage and frustrations through violence against each other. This slowly morphs into a larger, more radical movement known as Project Mayhem, in which its members engage in acts of vandalism as a way of fighting the system. Eventually, the narrator discovers Tyler's plans to erase debt by blowing up credit card companies and scrambles to stop this act of terrorism. Except in probably one of the greatest twists of cinema history, he also discovers that he's been living a split personality as Tyler Durden all along. Fincher and the cast had always been transparent on their intended themes for this film. It was primarily a movie on the growing malaise of Gen X men and the dehumanizing effects that came with the growing hyper-capitalist culture of the time. Screenwriter Jim Ewells attributes this message to the film's endurance all these years, that it hit a nerve with audiences and continues to through Tyler Durden's contempt for materialism, consumerism, and the impossible ideals invented by advertising. In effect, everything that is fake or a lie or a pathway to soullessness, all constantly bombarding us in our civilized world. I probably don't have to tell you that these issues and the existential crises that come with it are still very much prevalent, even among the younger generations today. We live in an era where everything is commodified, flexing is aspirational, and where online identity is everything. Inauthenticity is as palpable as it gets, as far as I'm concerned. So it's easy to see why Fight Club's narrator and the film's audiences alike would fall for the worldviews of someone like Tyler Durden. He is someone who genuinely doesn't give a f and for that, he lives life as a spiritually free man. If the narrator is a parallel to Patrick Bateman's insecurity and existential misery, Durden is like what Bateman would be if he traded his killer urges for actual self-esteem. He lives the life he claims to promote, and aside from his extroverted sales persona, truly does fit the bill of a Sigma male. The dude lives by his own rules and couldn't care less about the validation of others. But probably the most alluring thing about Tyler is that he does have a point at times. The current system truly is f***ed in a lot of ways. Brands and corporations have dug their claws deep into our culture, dictating how we see ourselves or gauge our self-worth. 
It's hard not to nod along when he repeatedly reminds us that, no, your value isn't tied to your job or your wallet or the kind of shoes you wear. Our forefathers showered us with idealistic visions of the future, though these seem to grow more impractical as the years go by. The cookie cutter life script of previous generations may just not be cutting it anymore. And while the film does an excellent job at portraying this angst, not just through Tyler, but through the rest of its characters, it offers no concrete solutions, and it never aims to. It's more interested in giving us a pretty profound diagnosis of a broken system, a mere warning for those who simply ignore its glaring flaws. And it truly drives this home by amplifying the satire as the plot escalates. When Tyler's fight clubs eventually morph into an all-out terrorist organization, intent on essentially destroying society, the film highlights how discontented individuals can easily be lured by the false wisdom of supposedly rebellious, but ultimately childish revolutionaries. Because that's that's what Tyler Durden is. He doesn't actually have any productive, long-term plans of fixing the problems he identifies. His scorched-earth nihilist philosophies may seem profound, but they ultimately emerge as excuses for self-indulgence. As Matt Goldberg of Collider writes, because Tyler's initial criticism lands, we're supposed to follow him wherever he goes rather than seeing him for the maniacal cult leader he is. Tearing down society completely so you can have a pair of leather pants that last you the rest of your life is what a teenage boy thinks about changing the world. It's not a real solution, and Tyler has no solutions. He just offers violence, chaos, and self-destruction, and calls it wisdom. It's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. But that didn't stop a good number of audiences from worshipping the guy anyway. First off, there were the actual fight clubs that began popping up across America, with members ranging from teenagers to adults well in their late 30s, with the most notable case involving an invitation-only gentleman's fight club helmed by a 37-year-old software engineer named Gintz Clemanis. His description of the underground group, when interviewed, closely echoed Tyler Durden's sentiments. We have to go to work every day. We're constantly told to buy things we don't need, and just for a couple of hours we have the freedom to do what we want to do. It was eventually disbanded when it moved out of his garage, but its members did go on to another group called the Dog Brothers, a stick fighting company that describes themselves as sweaty, smelly psychopaths with sticks. Their website is still alive and well today, and they at least seem to offer a much more structured fighting and training experience for those seeking their adrenaline fix. Then you had the more extreme supposed copycats, such as an incident in 2009 where a 17-year-old Kyle Shaw was arrested for bombing a Starbucks store in New York, a glaring parallel to the scene in Fight Club where Tyler's minions attempt to blow up a Starbucks in LA, just one of the many terrorist acts carried out by Project Mayhem. Investigators apparently connected the crime to Shaw's admiration for Fight Club, reporting how he told a friend to watch the news as he was about to launch his own little Project Mayhem. On top of that, they found that he had been hosting his own Fight Clubs around the city, with one member even suffering a broken nose. But when it came to the whole alpha male meta, the movie was also a huge topic among a niche but growing internet community. The pickup artists. You're so portable. portable? I want, yeah, you look very portable. This is so portable. That's sexual assault, bro. You do that with a black woman, you're going down. You see, Tyler Durden wasn't just an inspiration for anarchy and violent thrills. He also became a model for male suaveness and confidence for seduction forums online. Despite the fact the guy is blatantly portrayed as an erratic, a raging misogynist, seeing women as mere objects for sex and not much else. We're a generation of men raised by women. I'm wondering if another woman is really the answer we need. But as we've already seen from these alpha male obsessed dating gurus, they tend to be on the same page. One professional pickup artist actually even took up his name, Owen Cook, who used Tyler Durden as his alias, found his claim to fame by creating the dating coach company Real Social Dynamics, a group dedicated to helping men successfully attract women. Oh no, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Uh, sexually assault women, allegedly. This may come as no surprise, but the supposed dating experts had some pretty controversial ways of getting a woman's attention, ranging from just straight up being a creep. Creepy is actually not creepy, and not creepy is actually creepy. 
to literally forcing yourself onto them. The company is now fortunately defunct, though its instructors have moved on to teaching courses on personal development instead, which is another online realm that loves banking off of Tyler Durden's teachings, particularly as many of these groups evolved to eventually form part of today's manosphere. Expanding towards more mainstream platforms like Reddit, their skewed affinity for Fight Club has only grown as members pass around Tyler's gospel to justify their entitlement and disdain for the females, hailing him as the ultimate model of masculinity. One of their most popular spaces for doing this was within the Red Pill subreddit, an obnoxious cesspool of hateful posts that promoted various male sexual strategies through the lens of traditional gender roles and anti-feminism. And just in case people get caught up in vague definitions by anti-feminism in this context, I do mean seeing women as lesser beings. Their name refers to taking the red pill like in the Matrix, awakening them to what they consider the harsh realities of the world. These harsh realities often just use as a guise to simply promote discrimination against groups of people they simply see as less than. These guys have even co-opted Tyler's famous line, The first rule of Fight Club is, you do not talk about Fight Club stating that the red pill is to never be discussed outside of the subreddit because the truth is nasty and will get you in trouble. Guess they couldn't stick to their own rules because sure enough, the forum is now quarantined. But I stumbled upon this convenient little compilation that gathered its top posts, with much of them referencing their Lord and Savior, Tyler Durden, in their seduction and lifestyle advice. One of these tips even promoted the act of creepy, boundless persistence in order to bed a woman. The post states, Women will f pretty much any guy who's around at the end of the night so long as he has a stronger frame than she does. Because if the girl said no, then the answer obviously is no. No. But the thing right. is, is she's not gonna say yeah. no. She would never say no because of the implication. This is in reference to a fight club scene where Tyler forces his potential recruits to stand outside his house for days as the ultimate test of their devotion, and those who do eventually win a spot in his cult of enlightened men. I guarantee you do that for any lady, and the only thing you're winning is a restraining order. But that's just Reddit. People continue to hail the good word of Tyler on alternative red pill forums, PUA websites, and men's advice blogs. Which leads us to today, where he has since become the internet's quintessential Sigma male icon. An inspiration to those who truly wish to reject society, and most especially the femoids, who's got time for those. And sure, while plenty of these guys seem to have successfully internalized Tyler's anti-women rhetoric, most of these dudes also paradoxically crave female validation, or at the very least, make their choices based on it. It's clear to see how those who idolize both Patrick Bateman and Tyler Durden have a very selective way of viewing their stories. To see Tyler's radicalism as something to emulate would not only be disregarding the underlying satire, but also how the narrative ultimately unfolds. Which, sure enough, is how a lot of red pilled viewers treat the ending. They just simply disavow it. Realizing how Tyler isn't actually the wise presence he made himself out to be, but rather an unhinged lunatic, the narrator eventually kills this part of him by shooting himself in the cheek. The final scenes show him reuniting with his on and off girlfriend throughout the movie, Marla Singer, implying his departure from narcissistic antisocial nihilism to finally embracing actual, genuine human connection. Tyler was blatantly and always meant to be a cautionary tale, the illusion of someone who alleges social superiority and yet is ultimately a fraud. If the film offers us any sort of vague advice, it's to beware those those who claim to have the secrets to freedom, so long as you conform and buy into their narrow version of the world. And similarly to American Psycho, you could also argue how he represents the consequences of lacking a healthy emotional outlet, how this suppression can fuel an extremist response. In the film, the narrator struggles to honestly deal with and share his personal issues. Instead of opting for therapy or genuinely bonding with those in his life, he chooses to attend support groups for problems he doesn't even have, seeking out that emotional catharsis through the struggles of others. Eventually, this escalates into him literally forming an anarchic alter ego to further escape his inner turmoil. Fantastical? Yes, though we can see parallels in the real world where men, and especially young men, without proper social and emotional support, will often gravitate to radical figures and communities as a way of validating their grievances. In the end, Fight Club does have a profound message for its male viewers, but it isn't about elevating beta 
ideas to alphas or glorifying dated ideals of hyper-masculine power and control. It's a reminder that your authentic self isn't hidden in the grand promises of self-proclaimed gurus, flashy ads, or the traditions you've been told to desire. True rebellion is seeing through all this and realizing how no one can really tell you how to be. I think Rebecca Renner from Lit Hub said it best in her piece on this film. The American Dream told us what we should want and gave us the often quite rigged rules of how to get it. That's what people latch onto in the book and movie, the repression and a hyper-masculine way of expressing anger against it. Fight Club's real philosophy? the rules. The dream isn't worth the struggle, our freedom, our souls, or the time we have on this earth. Be who you are, whether that looks like traditional masculinity or not. Don't forget one of the most important characters in the movie has breasts. His name was Robert Paulson. His name is Robert Paulson. There's no slick playbook to achieving true individuality, but it always struck me as funny how the Sigma male archetype will both vouch for this while advising men on how to be through YouTube guides or stylish edits of questionable characters. And of course, a lot of these fictional dudes are incredibly well-written and some of my favorite protagonists, but it always kind of came off as missing the point when these walking morality tales are reduced to hustle culture quotes or romanticized TikTok videos. Another big current example of this would be Thomas Shelby from Peaky Blinders, who's engaging to watch and is excellently performed by Killing Murphy, of course. But he isn't exactly admirable. He's a gangster criminal who cheats on his wife and kills people. Yet he is widely glorified by those from the Sigma slash alpha male crowd as a man of virtue or some inspirational hero. And I don't know, it's like if I watched Breaking Bad and thought Walter White was a role model. I also find it really funny that a lot of these romantic Tom Shelby quotes or captions aren't even from the show. In fact, there's a whole Instagram account literally named Tommy Shelby Never Said That dedicated to making or curating these. His image basically exists on social media now as either a Tumblr sad girl or grinds that dude bro, which is kind of amusing. But hey, all you ladies out there, don't think you're off the hook. Us girls aren't exempt from idolizing equally questionable characters. I mean, there's an entire fandom literally dedicated to Amy Dunn, you know? The psychopath from Gone Girl? I get it, you know, she's essentially a middle finger to toxic, abusive men and the societal expectations placed on women. That cool girl speech was iconic from the day Jillian Flynn put it to paper. She's kind of like a female Tyler Durden in a lot of ways, you know? Charismatic, has a point, but is ultimately insane. David Fincher truly has a way of presenting us with seductive freaks. But that's the catch. She's compelling and relatable, just not a justified role model in any sense. Although the hashtag Amy apologists and hashtag Amy Dunn supremacy people would probably disagree. And don't even get me started on the whole dark femininity trend where people are revering manipulation and deceptive mind games under the guise of empowerment. Be a bad texter when it comes to texting with a guy. I'm telling you sis, stay relaxed, stay toxic, stay inconsistent. Like no, is it so hard to just act like grown ass adults and be honest with ourselves? This whole thing's just the contradictory Sigma male all over again. The idea around being a dark femme is basically breaking social constraints and not caring about men's validation. Both good things. But yet, a lot of its content is centered on gaining exactly that. And coincidentally, a lot of these, of course, also ultimately point to buying someone's ebook or online course. Like if they're baiting you to pay money for manipulation tips, one, take some time to reflect if you're actually considering that, but it's also screaming grift all over. All in all, my point is that we're so much more than these labels. Men and women aren't one-dimensional archetypes. It's a waste of energy and incredibly limiting to try and mold yourself into a specific category. And above all else, comes off as gravely inauthentic. No truly fearless, self-assured, empowered person goes around keeping a list of arbitrary social rules in mind from some random netizen's handbook. At worst, you're robbing yourself of your own liberation, and at best, it's just LARPing with extra steps, and believe me, most of us can tell. However, given how the alpha and beta labels have bounced around our cultural zeitgeist for decades, could there at least be some truth to this pervasive idea of a social hierarchy? Let's take a look. Be nice.
nicer. No, that means be a beta male, and that means bend to her will, that means apologize, and that basically means no attraction. Before we dive into whether our idea of the alpha male and its so-called hierarchy is even true, let's start by examining its origins. This article by the New York Magazine, written by Jesse Singal, offers a pretty concise breakdown of its rise to popularity. So the term alpha male was originally restricted to scientific research on the animal kingdom. In fact, before the 1950s, there barely seemed to be much talk around the concept. Although it's only a rough estimate, Singal reports that only 11 research mentions of alpha male show up on Google Scholar between 1900 and 1950. But interestingly, it yields about 2,220 for the period between 1950 and 2000. Much of this, he says, can be attributed to primatology research, where scientists have long studied the social structures and dynamics of gorillas, chimps, and other primates. Silverback gorillas and large chimps were often seen as the alphas of their group, typically performing violent or aggressive acts to establish dominance. These behaviors were never really applied to humans, though, until the best-selling 1982 book Chimpanzee Politics, Power and Sex Among Apes by primatologist Franz de Waal. His research drew connections between the group behaviors of captive chimps and that of humans in sociopolitical situations, which quickly caught the attention of politicians and businessmen. These guys all ran with a specific finding in the book that would soon be the cultural understanding of alpha males today, that the strongest and most intimidating of males land on top. Put a pin in that for now, because we will be getting back to that. But having made a splash in politics, it wasn't long before the concept would be used in discussions about presidential candidates, which was exactly what happened to Al Gore in the mid-90s. Time magazine would report on how his consultant, Naomi Wolf, argued internally that Gore is a beta male who needs to take on the alpha male in the Oval Office before the public will see him as top dog, the alpha male being Bill Clinton at the time. Wolf would go on to deny this narrative, but it had media outlets hooked, with one particular Times article running the headline, Can Gore Go Alpha? This piece featured experts sharing their thoughts on Gore's potential alpha maleness, with one concluding that he was too much of a loyal husband and father to achieve this. Fast forward a few years later, and American author Neil Strauss made waves by publishing his infamous book, The Game, which chronicled his journey as an ex-pickup artist in the seduction community. In it, he'd recount the lessons his mentors would give on how to be a fully-fledged alpha, and consequently, how to avoid being what they deemed a beta. Though meant to be more of an expose of this subculture, and by his own words, a book about male insecurity, it went on to become an actual bible for the same dudes who'd worshipped Tyler Durden unironically. They saw this supposed alpha-beta dichotomy described in the book as a notion to live by, catapulting these ideas into the mainstream consciousness. Once again, it's asserted that an alpha is the guy who succeeds, not just politically, but romantically and socially. By claiming his superiority through dominance and physical prowess. Through this, he gains power, money, and girls hanging off him. And if you don't fit in with this description, then well, you may just be a beta. Someone too soft or helpless to get what they want. The exact person they mean when they say, nice guys finish last. You're a beta male, Sonic. And through cultural osmosis, pickup groups, online communities, and popular media have been referring to this binary since, instilling in us the idea that to be real men is to be alpha and everything that entails. But now we've gotten to a point where there's an entire socio-sexual hierarchy to refer to, creating three extra tiers below the beta male ranking. Say hello to the delta males, the gamma males, and the omega males, who are generally considered the absolute bottom of the food chain. Women don't want them and men want nothing to do with them, so I'm not sure why Henry Cavill was used as an example of one, but hey, the definitions for these terms are as consistent as horoscopes. Probably less. Of course, we all know the Sigma stands outside of this hierarchy, but shares the same social ranking as the big mighty Alpha. Though as we've established, human personalities can't be classified into such strict categories, and the popular beliefs surrounding human Alpha male behaviors have long been debunked. Going back to Franz de Waal, the guy responsible for popularizing the term, he since reflected on the legacy of his research and has tackled the shallow misuse of the Alpha male label, because it's a far more nuanced concept than its traditional definition suggests. While usually linked to physical strength, domination, and intimidation, a man who's not dangerous, a man who has no physicality, it will never be seen as successful. Oh, I'm successful, I'm rich, and I'll, go to, yeah, but I'll, I'll break your neck. Look how big my hand is. 
I'm going to grab you by your neck and choke you till you die. I'll show you a race ride, pussy. DeWall clarifies how these don't necessarily make an alpha. The more important traits among both humans and even primates are empathy, compassion, the ability to lead, nurture, and console. I think it's always very unfortunate if people reduce the position of alpha male to being the strongest and the meanest and the biggest. And, and there's even business books that literally in the title, they say how to push everyone around, how to get the girl, and they have all, all these ideas about alpha males. Bullies do exist. In chimpanzees, there are sometimes males who are absolutely bullies. And unfortunately, they sometimes end very poorly because the group at some point revolts against a bully. But most of the alpha males that I have known were more responsible characters. They uh, keep the peace in the group. They interrupt fights between others. They stand between the parties till they stop screaming, for example. They console others. They, they show more empathy than the usual male uh, females. In general, show more empathy than males, but the alpha male is usually an exception, is a, is a male who comforts everyone. They create peace in the group. A much more emotionally charged set of qualities that are likely dismissed by the common ideas of alpha maleness, which tend to devalue sensitivity and emotional openness. And there have been multiple other studies that support this, a few of which were summarized by scientist Scott Barry Kaufman in his article titled The Myth of the Alpha Male. One by Jerry Berger and Mika Cosby involved 118 female undergraduates where they explored the link between typical alpha male dominance and sexual attractiveness. Sure enough, when faced with just basic descriptions of dominant versus non-dominant men, the women did indeed find the former more sexually appealing, but it wasn't as simple as a binary split. When they began evaluating the specific traits for ideal dates and romantic partners, typical dominant traits such as confidence and assertiveness were deemed highly attractive. But but other dominant qualities like aggression and demanding behavior were met with disinterest. Interestingly, the dominant traits they found favorable were most appealing when coupled with stereotypically non-dominant qualities like sensitivity and easygoingness. Additional studies by Laurie Jensen Campbell and colleagues further reveal how dominance alone isn't sexually attractive, but rather its combination with other pro-social tendencies such as agreeableness and altruism. To top this off, other research shows how aggressive dominance this being both the use of force or the mere threat of force, mainly attracts women during physical male-to-male -male competitions. When directed towards peers, however, this behavior is generally considered unattractive. Researchers suggest that women may perceive those dominating peers as potentially domineering in relationships as well, with their studies indicating a preference for low dominance in potential long-term romantic partners. So it turns out being a douchey alpha chad isn't all it's cracked up to be. Adding to this is the fact that status is context specific. There is no universal alpha male because we live in a complex web of varying social groups, each with different roles and expectations. You may be deemed an alpha in one community, but seen as a beta in another. Tug Speedman may have been a big shot action hero in Hollywood, but was trans when he entered the Golden Triangle. I recently rewatched Tropic Thunder. <laughs> but to use a real world scenario, Kaufman gives the example of a Fortune 500 CEO who may be seen as high status in our society, though would likely be at the bottom of the peck order at Sing Sing Prison. Then there are the countless successful men out there who absolutely dismantle the alpha male stereotype. Take for example a guy like Nathan Fielder. To be frank, the dude isn't exactly your image of a smooth talking domineering jock. I don't ride a motorcycle but I am a bit of a bad boy. And yet he's one of the world's most successful comedians. He's adored by millions of fans and he's got hordes of women who want him. His fearlessness also shines through his creativity, not through aggression or hostility towards others. New York Magazine also points to Kendrick Lamar, stating that his breakthrough album involved gangbanging, yes, but in many of the verses, he adopted the persona not of an alpha gangster, but of an exhausted and scared kid traumatized by gunfire around him. It's almost like people are incredibly multifaceted and the route to both social and romantic success can vary immensely from one person to another. All this doesn't mean that 
term alpha is completely devoid of meaning in social discourse, just that its significance is highly subjective. Its parameters are as flimsy and arbitrary as beauty preferences. Though generally related to success and prestige, they can differ depending on the context and who you ask. There's no single definition, no solid one-size-fits-all criteria, and by extension, no concrete guide to being a real man or achieving some sort of true masculinity. A cookie-cutter formula to personal growth and achievement just doesn't exist. Ultimately, the widespread conception of alpha and beta males came to be in the very same way characters like Bateman and Durden became its icons, through grave misreadings of the source material in the first place. But everybody mm -hmm. wants to overlook that phenomenal message that these men are dying to hear. He didn't, Entertain didn't go to these people's houses and like kick down their doors like, you better subscribe me to YouTube, you little beta male. No, there's a vacuum of desolate, broken men who are looking for a masculine leader and he filled the vacuum. Now, does this all point to deeper problems in society today? Challenges men may be facing that we don't discuss or pay as much attention to as we should? I think now that we've unraveled the widespread myths and stereotypes surrounding the alpha male phenomenon, it's also worth unpacking the root issue that fuel them to begin with. The manosphere may be rife with its misogyny and skewed philosophies, but it's crucial to recognize that not everyone walks through its doors explicitly seeking these out. It's a hub of support communities for men, after all, providing them with varying spaces to connect with, relate to, and advise one another on similar issues they may be dealing with. And to make no mistake, men in particular are currently facing a number of growing social issues. And as we address them, I think it's worth also noting the often suffocating expectations of restrictive, old-school manliness that tend to fuel these. I want to make clear that not all aspects of traditional masculinity are inherently bad. While certain ideals can promote unhealthy behaviors, it's important to recognize how exhibiting its healthier traits like independence, being competitive, being courageous, all entirely good and valid. The problem I'm specifically looking at is when this old-school concept of being a man and all the straitjacket notions that come with it are imposed on every man, because not every every dude fits into this one category, nor do I believe they have to. That said, I'll be referring to the more harmful traits of traditional masculinity whenever I bring up the term moving forward. Again, not all of its aspects are bad, but it will be the term I'll be defaulting to for convenience's sake. So I'm sure apart from all the alpha male content now shared online, we've all been culturally exposed to the stereotypical image of the supposedly ideal manly man. Someone who pulls in women left and right, whose career is his life, and is all about the hustle culture grind. Two words, entrepreneurship. Someone who's self-reliant and would never be caught dead freely showing emotional vulnerability. These metrics have persisted for years, restricting men into what Equimundo terms as the man box, a set of beliefs communicated by parents, friends, the media, and wider society that pressure men to be a certain way. These standards fall under seven main pillars, self-sufficiency, acting tough, physical attractiveness, rigid gender roles, heterosexuality and homophobia, hypersexuality, and aggression. Interestingly, while most young men will say they're still surrounded with such beliefs, most are also willing to reject them. However, those who still adhere to them often feel a greater sense of belonging or approval from society, highlighting the social pressure to continue conforming to these traditional norms. And sure, while some of these criteria may offer short-term benefits, they promote a shallow and potentially harmful version of masculinity in the long run. At worst, it can isolate men from the things that really matter. For instance, the pervading stigma around men's emotional vulnerability has made them far more reluctant to seek mental health support out of embarrassment or fear of being seen as unmanly. This can have tragic ramifications, with men over twice as likely than women to die by and based on recent reports, such stigma has also generally led to fewer or less satisfying male friendships. The twist is that vulnerable emotional expression is actually entirely normal among men up until a certain age. In a 2013 study by psychologist Naomi Wei, she reveals that during their adolescent years, most boys actively seek and cherish deep connections with their friends, often deeming this intimacy as the highlight of their friendships. These bonds were considered essential for their mental well-being, with many sharing how, if you have no one to talk to about the personal stuff, you'll bottle everything up inside and possibly take it out on yourself or others. But sadly, as they transition into late adolescence, the cultural stereotypes surrounding manhood and masculinity kick in. 
You said something gay, so you gotta say no homo, or else you a homo. But what did I say gay? You said you was gonna give this dude everything you got, no homo. That's not gay. If it sound gay, it's gay, and you gotta say no homo. How I know you not a homo, granddad, if you don't say no homo? I'm not saying no homo. Okay, you wanna be a homo. And in fear of being labeled gay or girly, many boys start distancing themselves from this intimacy they once valued. The result is a stark decline in emotionally fulfilling friendships among adult men. A recent November report found that while 70% of men say they're willing to listen to their friends' problems, only 48% feel they can actually rely on their friends for support, suggesting that while most guys will be there for their buddies, they themselves don't really reach out in times of hardship. Alarmingly, 18% admit they can't and will not talk to a close friend about their personal issues. And on top of that, 2021 research from the Survey Center on American Life show how men are almost half as likely as women to receive emotional support from a friend or tell them they love them. Yet, despite rejecting these types of bonds as they grow older, much of the boys in Naomi Way's study showed a continued desire for it, with plenty grieving the loss of such connection. This complements November survey with nearly half of the men expressing dissatisfaction with friends they couldn't confide in. Anthropologist Professor Robin Dunbar notes that adult male friendships often become more situational, centered on activities rather than emotional intimacy. In contrast to most female friendships, which prioritize deep, consistent emotional support. This difference can make it harder for men to maintain their friendships when the shared activities or proximity fade away. The pressure to consume yourself with work, often tied with expectations of being the breadwinner, also lends itself to a general decline in friends as men age. Most guys are raised to prioritize career and romantic relationships in their later years, and the Movember report even highlights this, showing how adult men typically rank friendships as less important than financial stability, finding a loving partner, and maintaining good health. All good things too, but they often end up feeling isolated in the process, typically relying on their spouse or partner as their closest companion. Then comes the expectation of hypersexuality, a measure of manliness that prioritizes sexual dominance and constant sexual conquests. This stereotypical value of masculinity, however, clashes with the realities of the current dating scene. Surprisingly, in an age where hookup culture supposedly reigns supreme, men are finding dating to be increasingly challenging. According to a 20 2022 Pew Research study, a good 63% of men under 30 are single, compared to just 34% of women in the same age group. At the same time, many of these single men are actively pursuing romantic connections, with half of them looking for commitment or casual dates, compared to only 35% of women. When asked why dating has gotten harder for them, men often reported difficulties in approaching people and feeling overwhelmed by their busy lives. And while technology has simplified the scene in some ways, the majority of dating app users are men, limiting the pool for heterosexual matches. To top this off, men often face more pressure from family to pursue romantic relationships. Often viewed as a marker of successful manhood, the expectation to date and be sexually active can thus create unnecessary stress and frustration given the current challenges of modern dating. All this feeds into the loneliness crisis men are currently facing, a growing global phenomenon particularly affecting young men living in individualistic countries. Cultures. Guys who conform to the man box are especially at risk of higher rates of depression and suicidal thoughts, which is especially alarming given their greater reluctance to seek out mental health support. Now, if you can't personally relate to any of these men, then that's a great thing. But these findings still provide a glimpse into why many young guys today might be wrestling with feelings of increasing isolation and disconnection. And it's exactly these feelings that can leave certain guys vulnerable to the tantalizing promises of the alpha males in the manosphere. A lot of these figures feed off of the insecurities and frustrations of these men, luring them in with the assurance of community and supposed answers or solutions to their problems. These solutions, however, are often laced with a twisted version of the truth to easily explain away their failures while offering a supposedly clear-cut guide on how to gain everything they feel they lack. Because most of these alpha male gurus appeal to masculine stereotypes and tradition, they usually target those who already have these more conservative biases, who follow the old-school guidebook of doing everything right and think this automatically offers 
offers a pathway to love, fulfillment, and security. They're essentially aiming for people like Fight Club's narrator. These are the audiences who'd be more receptive to their classic ideals of being a man and how to be more like them. But the advice they offer functions as Schrodinger's self-help. If it leads to success, then they cement themselves as reliable mentors and continue to uphold traditional masculinity as their savior. But when their advice fails, they can then shift blame to societal changes like feminism and evolving gender roles. They'll use cultural progress as the scapegoat for why men are held back on these supposed tried and true pathways to career or romantic success, rather than seeing that perhaps it's instead worth challenging the outdated perspectives or values they've been conditioned to cling on to and pursue. For example, rather than understanding that these days, sometimes simply being a nice guy with a job isn't enough to attract and keep a woman for the long term. Women no longer need to rely on men for financial stability. They no longer need to get married in order to survive. Thankfully, we have more rights and opportunities to be independent. But instead of seeing how the world has evolved this way for the better, and it may just be worth evolving with it, the guys who internalize common manosphere rhetoric will instead blame these social movements and its corruptive messaging for making it harder to date and wife women. It is because of women's empowerment that the babes are now being taken away from him. It is because of feminism and how it's given women a voice that they are now less marriage worthy. Women are qualifying themselves like they're men, two men. I make this much. I have this degree. I have this plaque on the wall. Nobody gives a sh Are you good with kids? Are you feminine? Are you nurturing? Are you the safe place? Can I come home and feel happy? What I'm trying to say is that women will gladly submit to their boss and their job, but they will not submit to their man. And that is why so many modern day women can't keep a man. The modern day woman is very masculine. Society and the feminists have skewed and altered the matrix into having women believe, get a good education and a good job, and you don't need a man. More and more people are single and less and less birth rates are happening in America. And men are tired of it. So what's happening now, men are getting passports and going overseas to find a woman. New flesh. No fucking good girls in today's society. And there might be one, two percent, maybe being generous, three, four percent of women who are saving themselves for their husband for marriage. Society's progress is to blame instead of their antiquated ideals. Worryingly, these ideas have actually grown in popularity over the last few years. According to the recent State of American Men report, more guys in 2023 are likely to uphold restrictive masculine values compared to those in 2017. Over half of the men surveyed agree that if a guy has a girlfriend or wife, he deserves to know where she is all the time, compared to just 46% six years ago. 41% now agree that a man should always have the final say in his relationship or marriage compared to 34% in the past. And 36% now believe that a gay guy is not a real man compared to 29% back then. The manosphere and its alpha chud leaders are alive and well, and their solution is to regress to a time where certain groups are seen as lesser simply for the comfort of those satisfied in their old fashioned views of the world. As YouTuber Sisyphus55 brilliantly explains in his video, Journey into the Manosphere, which I highly recommend you guys watch, alpha male ideologies typically devalue certain types of people in order to uplift their version of masculinity. By their criteria, this devaluation would automatically include women, the LGBT community, and even specific political camps. But the same disdain can also extend to certain kinds of cis straight men. Those who aren't financial warriors, who don't like physical conflict, who don't have a colorful dating history. This explains the copious amounts of stress and even a aggression when some men feel like they can't live up to the ideals set by old school notions of masculinity. It implies they have no value, when really, there's nothing wrong with disliking fights or hooking up or choosing to not make your life all about money. So unsurprisingly, these narrow ideas of manliness don't actually solve anything. They simply perpetuate these expectations that are ultimately damaging to both the men they claim to help and those around them. They restrict guys to a specific way of living in order to feel happiness and fulfillment, which may work for the short term, and in some cases, actually be a successful lifestyle for some. But many may feel like they've abandoned their authentic self in pursuit of an image. I'd argue that these typical standards, like the pressure to suppress emotion, to be hypersexual, to behave in specific ways solely because of your gender, are simply unsustainable. Human interactions, behavior, and expression are much more fluid than a stringent set of rules. For a lot of lost men, 
who choose to confine themselves in this man box, the cycle will simply continue. They'll end up feeling worse in the long run, continue relying on these communities for support, continue to have their biases validated, and be fed the narrative that it's not them who needs to change, but that the culture has simply evolved too much. Not only can this evidently fuel hostile or black-pilled worldviews, but in worst cases even erupt in violence as these men grow increasingly frustrated at trying and failing to meet these standards and what they believe they're owed. One of the slimiest aspects of these alpha male figureheads, as I mentioned a few sections ago, is that their solutions are almost always tied to a product. If you want to learn more about the secrets to being a loaded Jack Chad like me, well, sign up for my course or buy my book or subscribe to my Patreon for extra exclusive content. And because a lot of loyal viewers will buy into their stuff, there's an incentive to continue fueling these anxieties. A trend that Bujalka and colleagues highlight in their study of the Manosphere's thought leaders. They found that these influencers typically go through four stages. They stoke feelings of insecurity in their audiences, typically by catastrophizing the state of masculinity and primarily placing women at fault. It's worth noting that viewers are also often encouraged to see non-believers as the ignorant ones, as simply being too weak or beta cucked to accept these realities. Here's another video from a soy boy. It's like, oh yeah, like women are out here dating for resources and men are looking for the youngest, freshest, lowest body count woman. And that's like all they have to say about relationships. That relationship isn't going to last for more than like six months. I understand what he's trying. He's trying to say. Well, if it's just based on, on resources and, and you. Yeah, that's the balance between all relationships. It should be it should be about more. Well, what is that? Love, mutual respect, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, that doesn't pay the bills. But men have to perform. See, this is the thing. This is the fantasy of really blue pill cucks, really. You need to wake up, bro. There's so much blue pill propaganda. There's so much brainwashing going on that guys just won't get it. Now in this world where we are swimming in effeminacy, which is the unwillingness to let go of that which is pleasurable, men grow. They become men through suffering and sacrifice, giving up comfortable things, putting away the material mommy sucky sucky neediness. You are the definition of somebody plugged in. Look at you! Having cultivated this sense of crisis among viewers, they then offer up solutions to these issues, often framing them as definitive truths. These solutions, however, will usually come at a cost typically money. These products are not simply promoted through links and bios or through video descriptions, but are often continuously referred to as they discuss the crises and perceived threats to their movement or community. Then the final stage involves reinvesting their profits back into their threat promotion activities, and the business model continues. It's a grift and an evidently very effective one. Whether their solutions are seen as valuable or not, the fact is that they're often sought after and designed based on a cultivated sense of hostility against not just women, but general social change. The highest quality women that you're gonna meet, most likely they're not gonna speak English. The English language corrupts these girls because once they start learning English, then they start watching like Netflix from America and they start watching all this like toxic media that comes from the United States. So how can we prevent this and actually help men? Well, for starters, deplatforming isn't the answer, at least not for the long haul. While it may be a necessary and effective approach at times, it's a band-aid solution at best and may serve to only further mobilize their supporters. There's also the inevitable Hydra effect, cut off one of their figureheads, and another possibly more savvy thought leader will potentially take their place. A better long-term remedy, in my opinion, would be to understand why men flock to these spaces in the first place. And that would involve confronting why men today may feel lost or empty, driving them to seek out the security or stability they may feel they lack. The issues we've discussed earlier are a good start, though I by no means have gone through all the systemic problems that might be at play. Though it's worth challenging these greater systems that have been negatively impacting men, and honestly, the rest of us. This can be done on a cultural level, such as empowering men, especially at a young age, to accept healthier ways of expressing themselves, understanding that vulnerability can signify strength, not weakness, that being emotional isn't something to be embarrassed about, it's just a natural part of being human, and that that seeking assistance, whether it's emotional support or otherwise, is a positive step to reducing feelings of isolation. Male sexuality isn't a one-size-fits-all concept. Being someone who likes sex with women or men or who doesn't like sex at all doesn't make you any more or less of a man. We've seen from the studies that those in the man box feel a greater
greater sense of belonging due to being more accepted or approved of by those around them, even when they show greater rates of unhappiness. I think this shows how it's worth doing our part as outsiders in accepting and embracing different forms of masculinity. By helping the guys in our lives feel safe in expressing who they are, whether that aligns with healthy aspects of traditional masculinity or embraces a broader and more diverse spectrum of masculinity, they'll be better able to form more meaningful relationships with both the men and women around them. But there are also issues worth addressing on a systemic scale. For one, greater access to better mental health education can help improve men's motivation to seek help. Research shows that generally, men often have inaccurate perceptions of their own health and struggle to recognize mental health symptoms. They need resources to improve their mental health literacy, and this should include guidance on where and how to get the support they need. They also found that framing mental health support through the lens of positive masculinity helps. That is, promoting such services as aligning with masculine virtues. This involves reinforcing the idea that it's a responsible and strong choice to seek help, reassuring men that it is in no way detrimental to their manhood. Then in the US, there's the issue of boys and young men lagging behind in education. In his 2022 book, Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why it Matters, and What to Do About It, American English scholar Richard Reeves highlights this as a particularly rampant problem among male students from poorer areas and working class backgrounds, and above all, among black boys and men. His findings also reveal how one in four boys from K-12 are diagnosed with some kind of developmental disorder, which could include autism, ADD, and ADHD. Reeves suggests several potential solutions, including increasing male representation in K-12 education. This may not only provide positive role models for male students, but they may also be able to offer a learning experience better attuned to their needs. This may also involve redesigning the education system and teacher training in order to attract more of these male educators. The same thing can apply to the healthcare industry, such as fields of counseling and psychology. He argues that most young girls or boys would prefer talking to someone of the same sex when addressing their personal issues or learning difficulties, though these sectors are predominantly female. Boys-only scholarships, like those offered to girls in STEM fields, could also incentivize young men to excel academically. And expanding vocational training opportunities have been found to not only benefit young guys, but society as a whole. The emphasis, according to Reeves, should not be on returning to the past, but rather on helping men adapt to the current reality. As he puts it, we must ensure we're not putting the brakes on empowerment for women and girls, but let's have equally empowering, strong, and positive messages in our schools and classrooms for boys and men. Through improved grades and career paths, young men can pursue greater financial security and stability, potentially leading to better life opportunities and thus a greater sense of fulfillment, achievement, and purpose. Of course, there's also the need to increase access to such education, but that's a whole other beast. Again, this is all just a starting point in the highly complex, ongoing conversation of masculinity and men's struggles. It's worth keeping in mind that frustration among guys can also arise when the traits they've been told inherently give them value or a dominant place in society, such as being white, straight, and male alone, don't automatically equal to the successes they're stereotypically associated with. Men do have their exclusive issues worth exploring, and the societal pressures they face can span across cultures, race, and social class. While those who've caused or perpetuated harm absolutely need to be held accountable, again, it's worth understanding why so many guys are drawn to these harmful messages about manhood and masculine behavior. Some may simply be unaware or susceptible, but potentially open to change, and I think think approaching these guys with compassion could be a productive strategy. There also needs to be greater discussion of this in the progressive circles these manosphere figures have so strategically antagonized. Otherwise, this vacuum will easily be filled with their thought leaders and communities. And most of them excel at distracting viewers from these real greater issues they profit from and are thus motivated to reaffirm the status quo or the matrix they claim to challenge. Advising people that therapy is useless or that that suffering for work and money is aspirational is a tactic to ensure you keep turning to people like them for answers. In fact, their usual messaging is far from countercultural. These so-called alpha males will tell you that to be a strong, courageous, and fearless man today involves resisting a lot of social changes, particularly anything that challenges their traditional, simplified view of manliness. Their concept of it offers comfort and convenience, assuring them that their historic ways of thinking had always been right. It doesn't call for uncomfortable 
truths or deeper introspection, just an acceptance of the way things always have been. But I'd argue none of the positive traits I've mentioned are represented by any of this at all. There's nothing brave or noble about sticking to what's familiar. That's the easy option. Staying in your comfort zone is far more effortless than confronting or critiquing ideas you've taken for granted. It offers the illusion of safety and security so long as you never venture out of it. On the other hand, the ability to evolve with new ideas is a far greater testament to one's character and resilience than the need to cling on to some arbitrary cultural rules from decades past. A broad perspective, embracing growth over comfort, and choosing to adapt over getting stuck in one's ways showcases, in my opinion, actual strength and courage in not just men, but really any person today. Thanks for sticking with me this far, guys. That's about it for this one. This is, to date, the longest video essay I've done yet, but it's been a topic I've had quite passionate opinions for a long while now, so I do hope I gave it justice. And given the fact it took me about three months to get this together, I do hope all that time was worth it, and I seriously hope the next one won't take me as long. But anyway, feel free to share your thoughts and opinions down below. I know this one's a bit of a hot button topic, so let's keep the conversation civil. Oh, and who are your favorite, literally me, slash inappropriate appropriately idolized fictional characters. I have finally gotten around to watching The Sopranos lately, and man, do I love Tony Soprano as an anti-hero, but boy howdy, is that man f***ed up. Regardless, rip James Gandolfini, you and your team truly did set the benchmark for TV. Anyways, if you guys like this video and enjoy pop culture video essays and commentary in general, feel free to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Also hit that notification bell to keep up to date on my latest uploads, and with that, I'll catch you guys in the next one.